Welcome to our seminar on NPSH and understanding NPSH, which in the hydronic business is something that you really do need to spend a little time on and get it thoroughly understood because in day-to-day -day applications it can be an issue for you. In today's seminar, we hope that we can meet these learning objectives. First of all, real basically, I want you to know the difference in net positive suction head required and net positive suction head available. I want you to understand those two terms, be very comfortable with them, know what they mean, and know when to apply them. Secondly, I'd like for you to understand the relationship to the gauge pressure on the suction flange of your pump, the PSIG gauge pressure on the suction flange of your pump. I want you to understand how that relates to NPSH. Next, we have a simple graph method, and we give you these graphs later on, that you can use to figure out what the NPSH available is. Very simple procedure, graphical method uh, that we can use and you can hand out and you can send to people. But we also have a new method on the system sizer. The system sizer online computer program has available to you in it a section on uh, net positive suction head available and we're going to go through that. So you've got two methods. Last but not least, and probably the most important, how do you stay out of trouble? When you're designing cooling towers, you're designing condensate pumps, when you're designing pumping applications, how do you make sure that your suction piping has been designed properly so you do not have an NPSH problem, so you can avoid trouble? Those are the objectives we hope to meet today. So obviously we've got to start at the pump. And I love pumps, and you want happy pumps. You don't want pumps crying and tearing up and having a problem pumping because we did not pay attention to NPSH. So NPSH, what is it? You know, in theory, and you know, all the textbooks tell you, is net positive suction head. Great. Very simple. Now you know everything. In reality, when we get in trouble, we have another definition. It's called not pumping so hot. And we don't want you to have to pay attention to that particular definition. We want to stay with the right one. So how do we make sure that we don't have to worry about having trouble pumping as far as NPSH is concerned? Got to have a place to start. So let's start at vapor pressure of water, which is the most common liquid we will be pumping. The NPSH problems can occur with any kind of liquid. We're just going to work with the water today as a place to start. We'll show an application later on with another type of a system. But basically, here's what we're trying to get at. If you're at uh, zero PSIG, and you want to get 85 degree cooling tile water, if you want to get it to the vapor pressure, you can go to a negative 14 pounds gauge pressure before that water boils. Notice if you have a suction gauge on a cooling tower, you go to negative 14 pounds before 85 degree water would boil. If you got hot water 180 degrees, that vapor pressure is about a negative 7 pounds from zero PSIG. If you're at 212, hope you all understand, you put water on the stove, zero PSIG, sea level, it's going to boil at 212, so the vapor pressure is zero. But you can also put positive pressure on a fluid and raise the pressure on it above gauge pressure, above atmospheric pressure, and at 230 degrees, that's 6 pounds, at 240 degrees, that's 11 pounds. So the point is pressure is directly related to the vapor pressure of water or any liquid. So as we work through this a little bit, I think these numbers probably would help you understand what we're trying to prevent. First of all, we said 85 degree water could go to a negative 14 pounds before it flashes. So the top slide on the left hand side, if I take 85 degree water and I take it to a negative 15 pounds from gauge pressure, it's going to boil. It's going to boil at 85 degrees. You pull the vacuum on it, it's going to boil. We don't want that to happen in our pump because if it does, we've got problems. If you look at 180 degree water, that pressure, vapor pressure is negative seven. So if we went beyond that to a negative eight, like in the left-hand side of the slide there, you see what would happen. We'd have issues. And one of the most common ones you need to be aware of would be a boiler feed or a deaerator type of an application. Why? Look at the bottom there. In a boiler feed or deaerator, we've got a ditted system normally at an elevated water temperature in the condensate side, in this case we're showing 212, we've entered the atmosphere, so we know 212, if we lower the pressure below zero PSIG, any at all, that water's going to boil. So from a situation of applying NPSH, 
right up front, get in your head that boiler feed or condensate pumps are a critical application to understand NPSHN. And we need to really make sure we stay out of trouble there. So as we walk through this, we also need to kind of understand that we're talking about PSIG, the zero gauge pressure and atmospheric pressure is 14.7 pounds absolute or zero PSIG. That would be Myrtle Beach, sea level, no hurricane. What if it be boiling at 212 degrees or zero PSIG? But keep in mind, if you decide to go to the mile high city to go to Denver, Colorado, if you go there, next time you go to Denver, try this, take a bucket of water with you, put it on the stove, water in Denver will boil at 203 because you have less gauge pressure, less atmospheric pressure, and the pressure's down. Go to the top of Mount Everest, tallest mountain in the world, water will boil at 167 degrees. I know we have checked these out. I think it would be fun to go see this, but get in, your, get in your mind, we're talking about the atmospheric pressure controls this as well. So what is cavitation? What are we worried about? If we allow water on the suction side of our pump to get the pressure too low so we're below that vapor pressure, we get vapor pockets forming. We get steam, we get water vapor. Now as that water vapor travels through the impeller, we add pressure back. And as we add pressure back, that water vapor, that little bubble of, of gas will collapse. It will implode back to a liquid. And as you can see from the slide, this huge amounts of forces related are happening when that gas bubble collapses back to a water liquid. Bottom line is that's what you call cavitation. That's what you hear. When you go to a pump that's cavitated, what you're hearing is those gas bubbles passing into the impeller, collapsing back to a liquid, and that's what cavitation is all about. So looking at a centrifugal pump, how do we relate that to NPSH? How do we understand where that is? Now you're looking at a typical in suction pump here, and we're worried about the suction side. We're, we're worried about the internal pressure drop. Strange word. I'm not saying it wrong. Listen to me. We're talking about the pressure drop of a pump from the suction flange gauge to the eye of the impeller. Weird way of looking at it, but you kind of got to get that in your mind, and that is the required NPSH of a pump. What we're saying to you is, if you put a gauge on the suction flange of a pump, and you've got a pump running, that before the pump adds pressure back up and increases the pressure, there's going to be a pressure drop between that suction flange and the eye of the pump impeller. And this little chart kind of gives you an idea of what we're talking about, pressure drop. Why is there a pressure drop? Think about it. You've got high velocity, you've got turbulence, you're changing the flow 90 degrees to get it into the impeller. All this has to happen before the pump can add pressure back. So between the suction flange and any pump on the face of the earth, any centrifugal pump, between the suction flange and the eye of that impeller, there will be a pressure drop. And that pressure drop, by definition, is NPSHR, or the required pressure drop of that specific pump at that specific flow rate. From a little chart here on cavitation, you see the above curve, that pressure drop stayed above the vapor pressure. In other words, the available NPSH was greater than or required, and we stayed above it, so we had no problems. Look at the bottom chart. Look at the bottom curve. You see how the pressure drop dips down below the vapor pressure of the liquid at the eye of the pump impeller, and we're going to cavitate. We're going to tear that pump up. We don't want that happen. Uh, if it does happen to you, what are the results? Kind of a step-by-step -step process. Low pressure, form a gas bubble. Cavitation, the gas bubble collapses back to a liquid. That liquid hammer will erode the impeller, put holes in it, tear up bearings and seals. What can cavitation do to that pump? It makes it noisy. It's, it, it sounds like it's pumping marbles or rocks in a real bad situation, so it's pretty easy to spot. So it's going to make it run noisy. If it's severe, you will see pits or holes happening into a brass impeller. In fact, uh, it can go beyond that and really strip one away. It will also not give you rated flow. So you think you've got a pump curve here, you're pumping the right flow, and you're not. 
because it can drastically change the flow. Impellers and pumps are designed to pump a liquid, not a gas. It can also take stainless steel shafts and ring them in two. Think about it. You've got a liquid pumping along nicely through an impeller, and all of a sudden you get this gas bubble. And this gas bubble is, does it pump up like it? You can just ring it and shock it and ring the impeller right into it. Seals, all the mechanical seals, are meant to have a little liquid at the seal face. Now, where is the lowest pressure? At the eye of the impeller. Where is the mechanical seal? At the eye of the impeller. So if you get too much cavitation going on, too much liquid there boiling off, you'll lose your little wet seal and your seals will fail. So another problem with cavitation is seal failure itself. So how do we make sure none of these bad things happen to you on your next pump application? Very simple. We've got to keep that available in NPSH greater than required, and we have no problems. Sounds real simple, but how do we make that happen? That's a classical textbook definition. Let's see how we work with that. So let's go back to this definition of what required NPSH is all about. I mentioned to you that piece of S. The suction gauge pressure. We want to make sure you understand that that's something you can see. That's something you can go to the job site and you can measure. We want to keep it practical, so that's what we're going to reference it to. Well, we got a gauge pressure, the suction flange of the pump. By the time we get to the eye of the impeller, we have a less pressure. The pressure at the eye of the impeller is the lowest pressure that's going to occur in that system. And if that pressure gets too low, we get cavitation or vapor. So by pump, that's something the pump vendor has to give you. That pressure drop between the suction flange and the eye of the impeller is the required NPSH of that pump. Where do you get it from? Most vendors put it on a pump curve, and at the bottom of the curve you'll see an NPSH required curve on the NPSH curve. And all that is is the pressure drop from the suction flange to the eye of the impeller based on that specific pump and the flow rate in deep in from that pump. So as you can see here, as I pick a pump to the right, the required NPSH, or the pressure drop of the pump, goes up dramatically way out to the right. As I move back to the left, it goes down. If I start looking at different size pumps of the same specific flow rate, you will find that the pumps with the largest impeller eyes have a lower pressure drop than the ones with smaller impeller eyes. You will find larger pumps for the same flow rate have a lower NPSH, lower pressure drop, than smaller pumps. Interestingly enough, which one costs the most? Probably the larger pumps. So you've got to balance off first cost here dollar-wise with the required NPSH of a pump. It's very important you do this, that you understand that if you pick a pump too small, you're going to have higher required NPSH, higher pressure drops. That's the message you should learn. So how do we understand all this? we got required NPSH. It's going to be given to us from the pump curve. How about this available NPSH? Where does it come from? How do we understand that? Well, the available NPSH really has nothing to do with the pump. It's the system. The required NPSH is the pressure drop of the pump. The available NPSH is what are we going to get it to work with? What is the system pressure available to that pump to work with? That's the available NPSH, and that's where you and I come in. We have to be able to calculate that pressure. We need to know what impacts the available NPSH and how to deal with it. Here's a little simple example. Here's a suction flange of a pump pumping water. Let's say it's 180 degree water and the vapor pressure of 180 degree water reference to atmospheric pressure would be a negative 7 pounds. In other words, if you got a compound gauge on this pump, if the pressure got to minus 7 PSIG at the suction flange, the water would boil. Now, fortunately, we had elevation of 23.1 feet of water on the suction side. It's a vented open receiver. It's a cooling tower. It's open. It's, a, it's some kind of open process, 180 degree water. So here we go. We're vented at the top. We've got a column of water that says my suction gauge is going to read what? 2.31 feet per pound or 10 pounds at the suction flange of my pump. And my vapor pressure is a negative 7. So what is the available NPSH of the pump? Now remember we have got the 10 pounds positive pressure 
from the suction. Now vapor pressure wise says we have to pull a vacuum on it before it's going to boil. So in reality we've got 17 pounds of positive pressure over and above the boiling point to work with. So the available NPSH A in this situation is 17 pounds. Let's just keep working with this concept of what available NPSH is and looking at pressures a little bit and I think it will become clear to you as we move through a couple more slides. Let's pump some water at 212. Now we both know boiler water or water will boil at zero PSIG at 212. So the vapor pressure is zero, the water temperature is at 212, so we're already pumping a liquid at a vapor pressure of zero. Let's assume the suction flange has a gauge on it, and that gauge reads 10 PSIG. So we got 10 pounds positive pressure, uh, plus absolute, and look at it that way, would be 14.7 plus 10, or 24.7 pounds absolute available to us at the suction flange. So we have 10 pounds above the boiling point, okay? Now, what is the required MPSH of the pump? What is the pressure drop from that suction flange to the eye of the impeller? And we know we've got to get that from the pump vendor. So we've got to have a number there. We've got to work our way through it. But what is the design criteria for you? And we've got it in red on the right-hand side. Here's what the point of the whole slide is. You cannot let that water pressure drop below zero PSIG. If you let the water pressure in your pumping system drop below zero PSIG at any point, you got a problem. And that's all we're trying to get across to you. So let's take a quick look at this. Suppose we look at the available MPSH real quick. The available suction pressure is 10, so we're 10 pounds over and above the boiling pressure of the liquid. So the available MPSH in reality in this case is 10 pounds. That's the definition. What is the pressure available over and above the vapor pressure of the liquid at the suction flange of the pump? That's the reference, suction flange of the pump. And in this case, we're 10 pounds above the zero PSIG vapor pressure, so our available NPSHA available pressure is 10 pounds. What is the required NPSH of our pump? Let's assume that we went to the pump curve and the pressure drop on the NPSH pump curve is 6 pounds. If I got a pressure, excuse me, let's make it 4 pounds. If it's 4 pound pressure drop, I wind up with 6 pounds. I just jumped ahead of myself. 10 pounds available. My required pressure drops four. That leaves me six pounds of positive pressure at the eye of the pump and power. So if I put it into my little worksheet here, available is 10 PSI. My required or my pressure drop of my pump is four. What is the minimum pressure at the eye of my pump and power? Six pounds of positive pressure and 212 degree water will not boil because it has to get to zero pounds of pressure gauge before it will boil. What would happen if I changed the pump to a smaller pump and went to a required pressure drop of 12 pounds on a smaller pump? My available NPSH is 10. The required pressure drop from the pump vendor, the NPSH R, is 12. So if I turn the pump on, what will be the pressure at the eye of my pumping pump? 10 minus 12, I've got a negative 2 pounds gauge pressure at the eye of my pump impeller. That water is going to boil because it's 212 degrees and i got a big problem. So I think now you understand we have to keep that available NPSH greater than the required and we have no problems. So what is making this whole discussion kind of hard to understand for people sometimes? And I think this is where we really need to kind of latch hold of. It's the pump curve. Let's go to a typical pump curve. In the bottom of that pump curve is in feet ahead. I don't see any pounds on it, do you? I see GPM in feet ahead. And my NPSH required curve is on the bottom of the curve. And you see the graph in feet ahead for the NPSH is to the right hand, the right hand bar. So in this particular pump curve, it looks like it's running from about 10 feet and we're at about 12 to 1400 GPM up to uh, about 40 feet at 3000. And it can't go any higher than that because that's the max. I mean, you cannot go beyond what's available PSIG water. So the point of it is here, you would not want to pick a pump out to the right here. You kind of want to be mid-range, kind of around the peak efficiency point. But the pump curve is in feet ahead, not pounds. The reason it's in feet ahead, this pump curve is good for chill water, it's good for hot water, 
cooling tower or even other, other kinds of liquids in a wide viscosity range as long as you correct the horsepower for specific gravity. So the pump curve head makes it simple to publish a pump curve. We don't have to have a different curve for hot water and chill water. It makes it easy to work with. But it does complicate the NPSH calculation because there we've got to look at specific gravity. There we've got to know exactly the vapor pressure and temperature we're pumping. So let's focus a little bit on this PSIG, pressure gauge at the suction flange, which is the reference. And just to make sure you guys quickly understand, PSIG is reference to atmosphere. At sea level, it's 14.7 pounds absolute. It's zero PSIG gauge. And you just need to make sure you reference that as you work with this. So let's take a typical cooling tower, and let's go to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And let's see what the available NPSH might be on my cooling tower at Myrtle Beach. This is a very typical application I want you to understand. I got a cooling tower at Myrtle Beach, no hurricane, zero PSIG. That tower is elevated 2.3 feet above the suction flange of the pump, which gives me a positive pressure if I had a gauge at point A of one pound. But I have some piping, some fittings, some valving. I have some friction loss on the suction side of my pump between the pump and the coolant tower. Now, with the pump off, the gauge above the pump would read what? Plus one, plus one with the, gauge, with the pump off. But when I turn the pump on, I got friction loss of 4.6 feet or two pounds, and I'm losing. So I had a positive pressure from the elevation of one pound. I'm losing two pounds in friction loss, so when I turn the pump on, my suction gauge of my pump reads a negative one pound. Pretty simple little statement, but something you need to get in your head. And question, real simple question. At a negative one pound at 85 degree water, are we worried about cavitation? Probably not. And we're going to give you the available NPSH of this pump in just a few minutes. The message you should take home is this. It's not unusual on a cooling tower to see a suction gauge running a slight vacuum. Therefore, we keep preaching, please put compound gauges on all open systems on the suction side of the pumps. Please, on the cooling tower, make sure your specs, what you're sending out to the job site, is a compound gauge, meaning it can read below zero. It has to be able to read a vacuum because it's very typical in a cooling tower that you're going to find a vacuum. Now, in just a few minutes, we're going to use this negative one gauge pressure and that 85 degree cooling tower water to come up with what the available NPSH is on this particular job. But basically, here we're looking at the gauge again. I want to make sure you understand this gauge idea. The gauge in the left-hand column is a compound gauge. This particular gauge is actually full water specific gravity of one actually does cross over the reading feet. It's a typical little specification if you're interested. Let's go back to this graph. I don't want to scare you too much with this, but this is a handout we can give you. Very simple graph for you to come up with what is the available NPSH of a pump. Now, real simple, this graph is available to you from Valley Gossett. We'll be happy to send them to you in any kind of form you need them. And look at it real quick and real simple. This really drives home the whole concept of how do you calculate available NPSH. On our cooling tower, our pressure was a negative one PSIG. So on the bottom chart, I'm going to start at a negative one pound. Now I'm going to run up for water. The cooling tower temperature at the top would be 85 degrees, and the vapor pressure is about one pound absolute. So that's my next point going up. As I move over to the right, I'm going to cross over to the specific gravity of one, and I put a point there, and that gives me my available NPSH of approximately 34 feet. So all you would have to do here is come up with the suction flange pressure at the suction of the pump. If nothing else, go out to the job site and read it. Come up with what is the suction flange pressure at the suction flange of my pump. Give me that number. What is the water temperature or what is the vapor pressure of the liquid you're pumping? And what is specific gravity? If it's water, it's one. There's your available NPSH. What could be easier and simpler? This is a beautiful little chart. And basically, here's another repeat of it. I'm asking you to give me the suction pressure, the suction flange of the pump. I'm asking you to tell me the vapor pressure of the liquid pumping and the specific gravity, and I've got the available NPSH. And I plugged in here a negative one, 
85 degree water, coming all specific gravity one, my WNPSH is actually higher than 30 feet. One last time I plotted it here and as I look at this slide I want you to understand a couple of things. Take a quick look. Look at how the water temperature and the vapor pressure impact available in PSH. In other words, the colder the water at the same suction range, you see what happens to my available in PSH. The hotter the water, you see what happens. In other words, if I would take it up to 200 degrees, you see the available in PSH comes way down. What a beautiful way to understand this. Look at specific gravity and see how it impacts. So my message to you is I love the graph form because it's simple and easy to use and it also kind of gives you an overall concept of where this available NPSH is coming from and what impacts it. So let's move on to another method that we have available to us now. It's called the system size. For everybody online listening to this, just go online to the James Unpleasant's website and or the Bell and Gossett website and look for the system sizer. It's a free download, no cost one of the best tools you ever will find, and one little piece of that is devoted to, guess what, net positive suction hit. And it's a great way of determining online, on a computer, what is the available NPSH available to you on your specific job. Quickly, we're going to review this and apply it, and we're going to show you graphs from that computer program, because I strongly suggest everybody get this, download it, and calculate a couple. Keep these slides handy and they'll walk you right through it. Again, you see the definition of available has to be greater than required and you see the problems with the liquid turning to a vapor, going back to a liquid, collapsing, causing cavitation, tearing a pump up. Right hand side you see the same two charts, suction flange pressure, moving to the eye of the impeller, if that pressure gets too low we form a bubble. We do not want that happening. So you see a blow up of it again, and I cannot repeat this too much. I think this is a strange thing to people, is that the required pressure drop of a pump is the pressure drop. Kind of hard to think about a pump having a pressure drop between the suction flange and the other pump impeller. That's the definition. You need to make sure you thoroughly accept and understand that. So let's go to a pump curve again. We see a pump curve here typical pump curve and you see the NPSH required on the bottom and you see in this particular case at this selection point I'm running about what eight or nine feet required NPSH. So we know the required from the pump curve. What is the available NPSH? This is what we have to understand. So here is the classical, if you go to universities and pick out a book on NPSH, this is what you'll see. We want to calculate the available NPSH. If you do it by hand, this is the formula for calculating. And very simple, you've got absolute pressure above the liquid surface, wherever you may be pushing down on the liquid, and that's a positive pressure. You've got the elevation of that liquid above your pump suction, that's a positive number. You've got a negative number, H of F, which is a friction loss of your suction pipe. Ah, oh, we've got to keep that pressure drop low on suction pipe, we're going to have troubles, right? And last but not least is the vapor pressure of the pump at the pump suction. That's the formula. Very simple. If you want to do the classical textbook way, that's up to you. But let's use our little uh, system size of book and let's see how it looks. This is actually uh, a statement of the problem of a cooling tower in typical cooling tower situation. Let's say we got 250 GPM with a four inch pipe. Next thing you should know, you got your flow rate, you got your pipe size. Okay, next thing you should ask, what is the elevation of the liquid above the suction flange of the pump? And we hope you've got a cooling tower above the suction flange of a pump. Make sure you understand that. we got an open system here. We want that liquid above the pump. In this case, that vertical distance is three feet. In the suction piping, i got one 90 degree elbow. Take a look. It's a real simple piping system. And i got one gate valve. You see the gate valve there. Suction piping is very, very short. It's only 12 feet of actual horizontal on a pipe. I'm 2,000 feet up. I'm not at sea level. I'm elevated 2,000 feet up, which is going to impact the available NPSH now. I do have a belly gossip suction diffuser on my pump, an EE-3, and I'm going to take the water temperature to be 85 degrees on my coolant tower, which I think is a reasonable number to look for what's coming back from the coolant tower to my pump. What is the available NPSH, NPSH in this situation? Can you guys calculate it? Well, let's go to the system size. 
let's go to the system size so you turn it on get it downloaded and I wish I could bring one on live but just don't have the time but go to step one very first chart just change the fluid to 85 degrees it's important we know 85 degree water the default is not 85 so you need to go change it to 85 if you're going to calculate NPSH notice at the bottom that the vapor pressure of 85 degree water is six pounds absolute point excuse me point six pounds so it takes a big vacuum from gauge pressure to make 85 degree water boil. But the vapor pressure of 85 degree water is 6.6 .6 pounds absolute. Next step is go to chart two. We're going to plug in our four inch plane. We're going to plug in our 250 GPM. This gives us our pressure drop at 3.33 feet per 100 feet of equivalent pipe. So now we got the friction built in here. We got four inch pipe, 250 GPM. I got my friction. Next, you go to step three, the next chart, very simple. I load in, very simple, calculate my pump head calculations on the suction side only. Now you can use this for the whole pump, but all I'm interested in here is I want to know what will be the available NPSH on my pump. I want to know the pressure to suction flange. I want to know what happens between the liquid level and open cooling tower to the suction flange of my pump. I want the suction side pressure drop. That's all I'm interested in here. So on the right hand side, my pipe room is only 12 feet. Remember, I got one elbow, 90 degrees regular. I got one gate valve, remember that, one. And I've got to the right hand bottom, one suction infuser. In other words, you can put in strainers, check valves, anything you want to in the components down below. In this case, I've only got a suction infuser, EE-3. And guess what? That's already loaded in and make it easy for you. You don't even have to know the numbers. Just plug it in. When you put that in and do the calculations, you come up with a total head loss of 2.55 feet, left-hand column, white. You see the friction loss of that suction pipe, and it's 2.55 feet. And then that's beautiful. No way you can miss anything. You can just walk your way through it. Next step. Next step is we go to calculate NPSH A. There's a section in there, as you see from this chart, for calculating NPSH. And all the information you just entered follows along with you. You do not have to re-enter anything. That's what's so beautiful about this. You enter it one time. You go step by step by step and it just follows you. So now we're going to calculate the available NPSH. And we first thing, we're 2,000 feet up. Remember, 2,000 feet elevation. Pipe friction loss came over from the previous table, 2.55 feet. We just calculated that. Remember, it just came right over for you. But we got to put on the elevation Z. We're saying the tower or the liquid level of the tower is three feet above the pump suction. And then last but not least, on the right-hand side, you've got to pick the kind of system. On a cooling tower, it's normally an open system with the inlet above the pump. Now, if you the next one now will be below the pump, which I hope you never do. Or you can also look at NPSH on closed systems. The ones we're going to worry about today will be an open system. The most common application you need to worry about would be a cooling tower and or maybe a condensate pump. So we're going to, we're going to actually go to open system. And you see the left-hand column gives you the uh, left-hand chart gives you the available NPSH at 30.8 feet. Now you've got it. You can print it. You can put it in your file. In our detailed air loss calculation, you've got it. NPSH available done for you. I think this is beautiful. You guys need to make sure you download this. And all you younger guys who don't like charts, this is probably the way you want to do it. So now we gave, gave you two methods for calculating NPSH available. So very simple, we have to keep that available NPSH greater than a required. We've kind of walked our way through that. We got that in our heads. Let's take a look at a few applications and see what this means to us. Let's kind of throw a, a hard example at you, and we'll go back to a little graph system. You can use it either way, but I'm going to use the graphs in the next couple of examples. I'm trying to drive home to you at the high level of how to understand this. Once you understand it, I don't mind you using the computer. I don't mind you using programs, but I want you to understand what you're doing. And the best way to do that is graph a few of these things first, do a couple problems, get them in your head so you thoroughly understand them, and then go to the to the computer system. I think that's the way you learn. So this is the hardest NPSH problem that I could find. <laughs> Let's see how well you handle this one. What is the available NPSH on this pumping exam? I want you to tell me the available NPSH. We're not pumping water. We've got a lift. 
we're on top of a mountain, we've got all these things going on, can you tell me what the suction pressure is going to be on that pump when I turn the pump on? That, there's your challenge. Can you tell me the PSIG gauge pressure that's going to be on that pump when I turn the pump on? Boy, that's a, that's a good question. Let's make sure you understand the problem first of all. First of all, I've got a, 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 an exotic liquid that the vapor pressure is 5 pounds and the specific gravity is 0.6. It weighs 60% of water. Water specific gravity is 1 minus 0.6. So it's lighter than water and it will boil if I get the vapor pressure anywhere in this pipe and gets below 5 pounds absolute. This liquid's going to boil. We don't want that to happen. Next thing is I've got a 5 foot suction lift. I'm going to lift it 5 feet. I've got a foot valve in the bottom of it to keep it prime, but I've got a suction lift of 5 feet. Then on top of that, I've got six foot of suction line friction loss. Piping, valves, foot valves, six lines, six feet of suction line friction loss. Now to make everything even harder, I'm going to elevate it to Denver. I'm going to put it 5,000 feet up in the air. So my question to you is, what's my available NPSH, guys? Come on. If you can handle this one, you can handle anything. And this is why I wanted you to take the time to walk your way through this with the little line chart. So let's do this real quick. First thing, as I said to you at Myrtle Beach at sea level, 14.7, absolute pressure, the gauge pressure is at zero. How about on top of uh, Mount Mitchell? How about Denver, Colorado at 5,000 feet? Air is thinner. So my actual absolute pressure is 12.2 pounds. Or my actual negative gauge pressure reference back to sea level is a negative two and a half. In other words, I've lost force on top of my liquid, and I've got to I've got to make sure we understand that. Next thing, I'm working with a specific gravity of 0.6. Water specific gravity is one. We all know the conversion is 2.31 feet column of water, 2.31 feet high. Make a pound. So going back and forth, we know that the, 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 the constant is 2.3 feet per pound. Specific gravity of 0 0.6 is 3.85 feet of this liquid per pound. The liquid is lighter than water. It takes a column 3.85 feet high to make a pound. So we've got to use that. So let's go back and take a quick look. 5,000 feet elevation. I'm going to have a negative 2.5 pound gauge pressure on my top of my liquid. I've got a suction lift of 5 feet, 3.85 feet make a pound, remember? So I'm losing a negative 1.3 pounds in my lift. I've got friction loss of 6 feet, but I'm pump, pumping a 0.6 specific gravity, remember? So my conversion is 3.85 feet per pound into the 6. I'm losing 1.6 pounds in my friction loss. So what will my gauge read when I turn the pump on. Wow, there you go. Negative two and a half pounds from atmospheric pressure being on top of the mountain. I've got a suction lift, negative 1.3. I've got pipe friction pressure drop, 1.6. My suction gauge, reference to sea level, will read a negative 5.4 gauge pressure. Wow, if you can handle that, you can do anything. Now what do I do? Take that number to my chart, my little graph chart I talked to you about. That's simple. Go to negative 5.4 pounds on the bottom. That's going to be what my suction pressure would be, reference to sea level, on my pump gauge. Go to negative 5.4 pounds. What was my absolute pressure? It was 5 pounds absolute. In other words, I go vertically up to the red 5 point absolute because that's the vapor pressure of the liquid I'm pumping. Now I go horizontal to the right to the specific gravity, which was 0.6. It's not water, it's 0 0.6. And my available MPSH is a little over 15 or about 17 feet. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can do this example, you can do anything anybody throws at you on the MPSH, and you'll know you got the right answer. You can graph it out and get it to your customer. I'll put it in your file if you do an engineering job. So what are some do's and don'ts to stay out of trouble? We've been trying to give you a lot of basic information on MPSH. And, and again, we want to make things simple. We don't want to be in those situations. So let's look at open systems right quick. Do put the pump close to the tank. You don't want a bunch of pressure drop on the suction side. Get that pump close to the cooling tower. Get that pump close to the condensate pump. Do provide adequate pipe sizes. Don't make pipe sizes too small between the pump suction 
and the cooling tower will give you some guidelines in a minute. We want low velocities, not a time to be cutting back. Leave the suction line alone between the open system and the pump. Don't put three-way valves in there. Don't put fine mesh strainers. You don't want any excessive pressure drop between the cooling tower or the condensate pump and the pump because if you do, that reduces your available NPSH. Every time you have pressure drop, the available NPSH goes down, and that's bad. Never put strainers or valves in the suction line. You just don't want to do that because it's always added pressure drop. And again, any pressure drop in the suction piping reduces the available NPSH. And your whole guideline is you've got to keep the available NPSH greater than required. So you don't want to do anything that's going to reduce the available NPSH because that's bad. So don't put them in there. So somewhere in the suction piping, specifically with cooling towers, which are one of the major applications we get into, remember cooling towers aerate water. And that's what they do for a living. They, they take a thousand BTUs and they make it, you know, every pound of water and they take it out of the system and you've got water in the bottom of the cooling tower just full of air. All about all the air can hold. Now you've got to be careful with that because if you reduce the pressure slightly on the water, yes, you're reducing the available NPSH, but if you've got water full of air, the air is going to pop out too. So now you've got two issues going on in the cooling tower. Uh, on suction piping, and we'll take a look at it a little bit later, a little bit further. On the suction piping guidelines, and, and we like to have references. Here's a reference to ASHRAE handbook. It happens to be 1997, but it's not changed. The velocity exceeding 10 feet per second in suction piping is going to be noisy. That's, everybody kind of understand that. Look at what it says about branch lines. Branch lines. You've got multiple cells, multiple towers, multiple pieces of pipe. Actually, he's saying you probably should keep it uh, not to exceed five feet per second. That's pretty slow. That's a pretty, uh, pretty strong statement there. Uh, let's go over to HI, Hydraulic Institute. What does it say about suction pipe? HI, who every pump vendor I know in the world belongs to, so this is not Bell and Gossett saying this. This is everybody. Uh, with pipe velocities in the five to ten feet per second on suction piping, you got valves and fittings and so forth. You might need five to ten pipe diameters to straight pipe. In other words, kind of saying the same thing. They're saying if you get above five feet per second, you better pipe, you better start adding some straight pipe to make sure you don't get turbulence a lot of friction loss per HI. Uh, let's go back to my cooling tower we talked about a few minutes ago. Make sure you understand all this. My cooling tower hopefully is elevated. It's going to be full of water that's been airy. It's been full of air. And so if you've got air coming out of it, where is the air going to go in a piece of pipe? So first of all, in the piping, we want what kind of fittings? Eccentric fittings, but we don't want it piped as shown in this slide. We want it piped as shown in this particular slide. In other words, we want the flat part on the top because the air is going to collect at the top of it. If we trap it there, we're going to tear our pump up. We're going to get a slug of air and we're going to tear a pump up. This happens so often, it's unbelievable. You're going to get a slug of air and you're going to tear a pump up. Think about what happens between the coolant tower and the suction flange of the pump. If you have any kind of pressure drop at all below zero PSIG, then the air that's been in the aerated in the coolant tower is going to come out. That's not cavitation, that's air problem. But air sounds like cavitation. So one of the things you're going to have going on on coolant towers that's confusing to you is air will come out before you get an NPSH problem. And it sounds the same way. But you've got to understand you're pumping a liquid that's fully aerated, and if you put a slightly negative pressure on that liquid, the air is going to pop out. If the air pops out, it sounds like cavitation. So we've got to deal with those bubbles. We want the eccentric fittings flat on the top so we don't have that problem. And we want 5 to 10 pipe diameters of straight pipe based on the velocity you want to try to pump through that suction pipe. So here's kind of a summary of what we've already said to you, but I think it's pretty straightforward. You see the pipe dampers which have been recommended. You see where they're coming from. The eccentrics are there. Limit your reduces to one pipe size. Just make sure you understand that in suction pipe. If I've got a 10-inch connection coming out of my tower and I've got to reduce the pipe now, don't go from 10 to 6. Go from 10 to 8. One pipe size reduction at a time really makes a huge difference. If you've got multiple pumps, slow the water down or try to use a tapered wire. If, you, if you're going to use straight branches, you've got to slow it down to 5 feet per second. Last but not least, you need some kind of a safety margin on your NPSH. 
What's reasonable? We asked Bellin Gossett to give us a reasonable statement. This would apply to anybody, guys. This is nobody's particular pump. Anybody's pump would, would need some kind of a margin. You don't want to design your systems on the edge. So this is kind of a guideline recommendation that came from B&G. And you see the note left-hand column on Coolant Tower pumps. Remember, Coolant Towers have highly aerated water to deal with. So you've got air bubbles to deal with as well as worried about EMPSH. So Coolant Tower summary, this is one of the most common applications we have with the Coolant Tower. What are some good rules to make sure you don't have to worry? about NPSH on the coolant tower. Make sure that tower is above the pump. Get your liquid up above it because the more you elevate the sump of the coolant tower and the minimum level of the water in the coolant tower, the more you are adding to the available NPSH. That's good. Always bypass the sump if you're going to put a bypass. In this day and age, most people use two-way valves and modulate the flow, but if you're going to bypass, bypass to the sump. We would suggest that you not exceed five feet per second. Can you design it above that and make it work? Absolutely. But slow down if you're going to do that. Make sure you've got straight pipe. Make sure you've got a good pipe design if you're going to get above five feet per second. And that information is coming from HI and from ASHRAE and from BNG. Last but not least, we are recommending a safety margin. And you see the numbers we recommend. Don't go picking the required NPSH right on top of the, the available. Get yourself a safety margin to work with. So if you, what do you do if you've got high pressure drop in your piping? What do you do if the tower is 100 feet away from your pump? My suggestion is you need to go to a vertical turbine. If you've got long suction piping runs that's going to give you a lot of friction loss in your suction pipe, I would strongly recommend you go look at a vertical turbine application and get rid of that NPSH problem. You do not want to do that. You do not want your tower a long ways away from your pump. If you do, you're going to have a problem. So common sense, you've got high pressure drop in the friction side of your pump, you turn your suction pipe and your pump to your tower, go to vertical turbines and save a lot of problems. So let's go back and look at NPSH. We said the NPSH required comes from the pump then, that, that it's the pressure drop of the pump and they have to give you that. How do you think a pump vendor gets that information? They want to test, they put it in the lab. And they put a gauge on the suction plant, and they put all these pressures in there, and they measure the required NPSH of a pump. What kind of pipe do you think they're using? They're using a long straight pipe. It's probably stainless steel shiny pipe. It's probably two miles long. I'm going to the extreme, but my message is there's no valves in it. It's a piece of straight pipe. They want the best NPSH R curve they can get you. What happens? You come along and throw a short radius, short radius elbow on that. What have you done to that pump? If you come along and just slap a short bladed elbow on it, it's not the way we did it in the lab. So we cannot get the same results. You're going to hurt the pump performance as a minimum. You may create all kinds of problems. What should you do? Straight pipes, one answer, if you got the room. If you don't, good application for suction diffuser. In fact, that's why suction diffusers were invented. Suction diffusers have turning veins in them to turn that column of water in a very tight pattern into the eye of the pump impeller in a smooth method to give you rated flow. In fact, b and will tell you if you take a suction diffuser on us and put it on our pump, we'll give you rated flow, rated capacity. You won't lose anything. How about on a double suction pump? I keep hearing that come up. Well, if the double suction pumps tested the same way. Nice long piece of straight pipe and the double suction pump, the whole, whole idea is you've got two sides to the impeller. You, you, you figure half your water is going to come through one side of the impeller, the other half to the other side of the impeller. It's called a double suction impeller. And by doing that, we reduce the, the loads on the bearings. We make the pump run real smooth, last a long time, you get longer life, as long as you're doing that, because we've got a balanced thrust load on the bearings coming from both sides. What happens when you pipe it like this? Same story again. You add a turbo to the suction side of the pump, you don't have a straight flow pattern, and you're going to overload one side of that pump and valve. You're going to overload one side. Now you're going to add thrust loads to the bearings. Now, depends on how bad you do this, how much trouble you get, but it's certainly not going to give you rated flow, and you certainly violated what you should be doing. Another reason to use suction diffusers on double suction pumps as well. Now, 
I hope you don't laugh at this slide, but sometimes we talk so much theory, I like you to see the real world. This is a real double suction pump application that we came across the other day, and I took a picture of it. It is a double suction pump on the suction side. And you see the eccentric fitting installed wrong way, right? What do you think is going to happen to that big bubble there? We're going to have air problems galore. And we had air problems. And I'm not going to tell you who this is, but have a little fun with this. We had air problems so severe, as you see the contractor went and put gauge tappings on there. To begin with, ladies and gentlemen, he put an automatic air vents on there. But guess what the problem was now? He had a vacuum. That's right. It's a coolant tower. We have a slight negative pressure, which is not unusual. You saw a coolant tower at Merle Beach on a negative one pound. You put an automatic vent on here, or you open a mega vent, what's going to happen? You're going to suck air and make it worse. In other words, this pump, that air bubble is going to tear that pump up. I, I bet you money we're going to have pump problems with seals and bearings, and this pump's going to be a huge problem. That's why we documented it, because this is not right. And you see that air bubble is going to have the potential to destroy this pump. How do you like this? Now, if you've got an elbow to come into a suction of a double suction pump, if it's in the same, same plane with the impeller, okay, but not from the side. This is where we showed you a little while ago what was going to happen. We're going to overload one side of the impeller. We're going to add thrust loads to the bearings that should not be going on. This is not a good pump design. And again, I hope you understand why. Oh, I'm not through. How do you like this one? Well, I have never, I, don't even, I can't believe this one. And by the way, you see the check valves on the right hand pipe, so the suction's on the left hand side. You see how the suction wraps around, what is it, 180 degrees on the suction side? And it came out of an elbow 90, so it went 90 foot to 180. And you tell me this pump's going to perform? It ain't my fault. That's one of my famous sayings in my old age. But guys, we can't live with this. This pump's going to get torn up. It just doesn't make any sense. So, good answer on double suction pumps where you can and you've got tight space problems. Use a suction diffuser. Smooth out that flow. Let's get long, good life out of these pumps. Now, as we kind of wind this thing up, the other major application that we see daily would be condensate pumps or boiler feed pumps. And I kind of want you to kind of get comfortable with this one. We went through the cooling tower thing. But let's look at condensate pumps because you've got another major change here. You're dealing with higher temperature water. You're dealing with condensate at 212 and a vented receiver. So what is a vapor pressure? It's, it's, it's zero PSIG. You're already there. So you don't have a lot of available MPSH available. Let's see what you've learned. Let's see how good you really are. Take a look at this application. I'm at Myrtle Beach, Zero, zero PSIG, 14.7 pounds absolute. Okay? I've got a vented receiver, a vented tank. My tank has in it condensate at 212 degrees. I've got my tank elevated five feet above the section of my pump. I've got my tank elevated five feet above the section of my pump. I've got friction loss between my receiver and my pump of a half a foot. My question to you, everybody online, what is the available NPSH of this particular application? What is the available NPSH? First of all, I'm at vapor pressure already. I'm at zero. If I let the liquid get below zero, it's going to boil. The available NPSH, ladies and gentlemen, is I got five feet of positive elevation. I'm losing a half a foot. I've got four and a half feet NPSH A, four and a half feet available NPSH to make this thing work because I'm trying to pump a liquid at its vapor pressure. That's the key thing you got to understand. This is not cooling tower water. This is condensate. I'm at 212. I'm at vapor pressure already. I have no safety factor in my vapor pressure. I'm already at the vapor pressure. So my available NPSH is only four and a half feet. What does that mean to me? That means you've got to pick a pump with the required NPSH less than four and a half feet, or this thing is going to cavitate. How many pumps out there are less than four and a half feet? Here's a domestic kind of safe pump, one that we happen to make, that has a little inducer on the bottom of the pump impeller and a big wide suction connection. And that little inducer puts just enough pressure on the normal impeller, out of the impeller, to give you a required NPSH of two feet. In other words, the pressure drop between the suction of this pump to the out of the impeller is two feet or less. Required 
pressure drops two PLS. Now you begin to understand why on a condensate pump we need pumps like this. So all we've done on the pump curve, and this is a typical little pump curve for picking this, we made sure that we pick this pump with the required NPSH, and those numbers are shown as a vertical line in this particular pump curve. I'm making sure you cannot buy or pick this pump to the right-hand side of the two-feet column. We're going to make sure you pick the pump to the left-hand side. That anything to the left of that yellow two-foot required NPSH line, your required NPSH is going to be less than two. We might need to put flow limits on this pump. We've got to make sure it cannot pump to the right. So on condensate pumps, they have to be balanced. Look what would happen to a condensate pump if we let it run off to the right. The NPSH goes nuts. So we have to make sure we pick it at two foot or less, and we restrict that flow to whatever that design flow number is. So you take this information, let's see what you've learned now. Let's pull it all together and summarize it here. If you can understand the next two slides, I think you really have got a pretty good grasp on NPSH. Let's just take a, a sea level application and a condensate tank at sea level, at Myrtle Beach, at zero PSIG. If that condensate receiver is at the same level as the pump, if the condensate receiver is at the same level as a pump, there's no elevation of the liquid above the suction flange. It's at the same exact elevation. If I'm pumping 212 degree liquid at sea level, at zero PSIG, at atmosphere, what is the available in PSH? It's zero. You got to understand, if you understand this, you're there. Because if you're pumping liquid at 212, which is vapor, and you're at the same level, same level, there's nothing left. There's no available in PSH at all. It's zero. You've got problems. Now, what happens if I elevate the receiver to feet? Let's go backwards. What would be the available in PSH if I kept the same setup, my receiver's at the same elevation as the pump, and I lowered the temperature. Let's lower it to uh, 209. If I go 209 degrees, I'm still at zero PSIG. My vapor pressure would be zero PSIG would be 212, but I'm pumping 209. So now I've got a little bit of vapor pressure available to me to work on my available NPSH. So now my available NPSH is two feet. And you see what happens as I go on down. I've got coolant tower water at 85 degrees, same level, same, same exact elevation as my sump. My bell NPSH is 30 feet. So you see the impact of the vapor, of the temperature of the water on the vapor pressure and on the available NPSH. Let's go back to condensate. If I'm pumping 212 degree condensate, what do I have to do to my deaerated tank? What do I have to do to my receiver in order to pump it? I have to elevate it. Every day already you see in the world was elevated 8, 9, 10, 12 feet in the air to give you more available NPSH because it's trying to pump a liquid at its vapor pressure. There's a little picture of a couple of little condensate pumps, but basically the one on the left hand side, if that receiver is mounted to my pump and my pump has a required NPSH of 2, then the max condensate at the same level I can put to that tank is 210 degrees. Because 210 degrees or 209 degree liquid has a has two foot available in PSH from the vapor at zero PSIG at Myrtle Beach. I only need to, so I can pump 210. If I've got to pump 212 degree condensate, the one on the right, if I've got to pump 212 degree condensate, and if my pumps have a required in PSH of two feet, I've got to elevate the receiver two feet. It's that simple. If I'm pumping boiling condensate at 212 and my required pump, NPSH is 2. I have to elevate the receiver 2 feet and I can pump 212. So condensate is a huge application. You need to understand your temperature of your condensate and make sure you get the receivers elevated enough to give the available NPSH you need to satisfy that required NPSH. Ladies and gentlemen, I have enjoyed this. It's been a lot of fun. We'll be happy to send you these charts. Please go online and download the system sizer. Have a great day. We appreciate your time.